So I guess we can talk about uh, the console a little bit. What I'm working on now is this um, sort of motown -y sounding thing. And I've really been into this, uh, this thing of trying to get drum sounds with just one microphone. And uh, so that's, that's what this is. The, the drums are just, uh, just one channel, one mic. It's the setup that we actually saw out in the sound room a, a moment ago. Um, it was just a, a, an, an RCA KU3A just sort of pointed at the center of the kit a few feet away. Um, so... So that's... That's the drum sound, uh, just one mic with a ton of EQ on it. Um, and uh, these EQs have made it possible for me to, um, you know, pull this off a lot easier now. They're so, they are so flexible and um, still remain real musical sounding. And so I can do very, very extreme EQ moves with, uh, without it sounding overly EQ'd. So what we're listening to now has a ton of EQ on it, this, this particular drum sound. So then here it is without the EQ. So all the low end, uh, everything is all being manufactured by the equalizer. And there's a little bit of spring reverb on there. You can hear that guy. That's, that's without the reverb. Got a little bass, piano, vibes. There it is all together. So I can show you what the EQ is doing individually. All right, so for this, I'm actually using every single band of the EQ. Um, so the first thing is enhancing the low hand a little bit with this high pass filter. So it's actually lopping off everything below somewhere around 70 hertz, and, uh, but creating a resonance at 70 hertz. And then uh, I'm actually boosting high end with the, the low pass filter. And so, so that's boosting. It's a little more subtle but it's just adding a little bit of uh, air on top of there. And then it's disposing of all of the uh, other high end above, of, above that point. And this is probably somewhere around 15K. It's just creating a little peak and then just kind of rolling off above that. So then um, there's uh, a move here that's the majority of the presence. So that's like at about 2K, a really broad... Uh, lift, shelf EQ that's just turning everything up. So then, uh, then I add even more low end with this uh, low frequency band, and so there's the meat of the kick drum. And then I added a little bit of body of the snare drum. But this is without it. It's a little thin. That's with it, a little thicker on the, on the low end of the snare. And then, uh, and then I just sort of tucked in some of the high mids a little bit just to make it a little sweeter sounding in the high end, not, not quite so harsh. Add a little, digital, uh, little spring reverb. Got yourself a Motown drum sound. is.
So other stuff I've got going on is um, uh, on the console I've got a, a mixed bypass and so I can uh, you know an, uh, an insert uh, in or out so I can uh, add uh, mixed bus compression just with this switch. This is without it. That's with it. And I'm using this uh, undertone unfair child thing. This is our version of a, of a fair child. It's, it's set really, really subtle for this. I'm trying to just keep it sounding kind of natural. So it's just a little bit of glue. That's without it. That's with it. So all of this stuff um, that's a part of this track was recorded through this old Studer tape machine on the way in. Um, I set it up at seven and a half ips, so it's just really crunchy sound and really cool old vibey sound. It's a huge part of um, the drum sound, that one mic drum sound. With, uh, without that, it just it doesn't have the same sort of uh, thickness and density in the sound without having the tape compression and distortion and stuff on it. Um, another thing I always like to have is uh, in the control room is a turntable. I pretty much, uh, when I'm, you know, normalizing the console, putting things away, cleaning up, I pretty much only listen to vinyl. <laughs> um, I love uh, old records, old like uh, audio file records. Percussion records, Stereo Rama. They were like uh, an old audio fire file record company, and uh, they sound amazing. It's just uh, great to listen to that stuff and sort of keep in perspective, you know, um, some of the old techniques and technologies that sounded so incredible in the past, and uh, not get lost in uh, the modern digital stuff. Um, we can see a bunch of the outboard gear here. Um, there's a, c a couple other things that I've talked about recently. There's, um, I have a couple, uh, a whole little collection of, of 1176s. I have two black faces and and one uh, uh, and two two blue stripe ones. Yeah. So this guy right here is just an, a magical vocal compressor, and I, I use it on pretty much every vocal all the time. Um, it's always set at four to one. Um, you know, this is usually about where it's set. It's, it's like an attack of one or two, so pretty slow, a release pretty fast, um, just depending on the, the mic gain and stuff, but usually quite a lot of compression, and um, uh, yeah, that thing just always works. It's impossible to set it wrong. These are the, uh, the uh, Orban EQs I really love. Um, I've been using those for a long time, probably 25 years. I, I, I first discovered those, and it was the first really surgical EQ I had ever got my hands on. It changed everything for me. It, it, it was really a significant thing, and you know, and part of why I took the time to design an equalizer for a console that has the same type of power and flexibility that that those EQs have, where you can get super surgical really um, carve things out, but these are done, you know, with um, the type of vintage Class A circuitry that, um, that I really love the sound of. And so, you know, the Orbans were great because they're very powerful, but they're all based on, you know, ICs and stuff. And, uh, you know, nobody had ever done this before, and I, I wanted to have everything. I wanted, like, I want all the control and the power and be able to carve things out, but I want it to be class A and sound really musical, and you know, there, there it is. We did our best to, to build it. There's um, these things, I've talked about these, these dynamic equalizers, I use these all the time. They are really, really cool, just, uh, you know, kind of uh, not wildly expensive and incredibly powerful tool. I can fight my way out of any crappy vocal recording with, uh, with those boxes for sure. Um, these are all of my favorite bus compressors right here. Um, 
the 2500 that's actually kind of new for me I'm sort of a latecomer on that I know people have been loving that thing for a long time but uh, I just got that thing maybe four or five months ago um, DCL 200 Allen Smart C2 and uh, the Crane Song STC8 I use those are what I use most of the time for modern stuff um, my, my, my beloved distressors <laughs> Use those on, on everything. They're always on the drums. It's actually on this little mono drum thing right now. You can you can see it bouncing away. Set up with the uh, the high pass and the peak emphasis, so it's grabbing more of the snare drum and as little of the kick drum as possible to sort of uh, make the kick drum come out louder in the in the blend. And then uh, this is all of my other my other stuff. Um, you know, just only a handful of digital reverbs and stuff, and um, uh, lots of old tube compressors. These are modified stay levels, modified Altex, um, these old uh, um, Summit Audio t TLA 100s. I had those, I've had those for a long time. I got the first one of those back in the late 80s. It's one of the first ones that they actually put out. I think it's like serial number 11 or something like that. That was the first good compressor I ever owned. <laughs> and then these things, these are the, the you don't have this compressors. I actually mentioned these re recently on a forum. Um, these are pretty funny. They uh, supposedly came out of um, a mastering studio, uh, at a mastering room at Decca Studios in, in London. And um, they're really, really great on vocals. Um, really cool sounding compressors. And... Uh, there's uh, the Roland Chorus Echoes. I use those all the time. Love those on vocals. They're all over, you know, most of the stuff I work on. Um, bunch of gates. Um, this is uh, my, my friend uh, Jeff Turzo, his FET uh, overstayer compressor. He's making really cool stuff. He actually really helped me out recently because um, I did a surround mix for a live show and I needed a compressor, a six channel compressor that could all link together and so he custom set up um, three of his stereo VCA compressors to be able to do that and they worked awesome. They worked amazing. So, so that's pretty much it. Lots of stuff. I got this old Scully 16 track. I use that for all the drums and bass on uh, the Slash record, this recent Slash record. There's also uh, the second uh, Death Ray record that I did was recorded entirely on that thing. Um, these two machines I've had forever. Um, uh, these were also purchased in that same uh, era when uh, the band T Ride got signed and we were buying equipment with uh, record company album budgets. Um, so yeah, this machine usually is, stays set up as a um, two-inch sixteen track, and uh, so I, uh, like on the Queens of the Stone Age record, I used that for the drums and bass, and then we did all the overdubs on this machine, and uh, that same that same formula was used for the first Third Eye Blind record, um, the T Ride record. Uh, you know that was definitely my my main sort of uh, tape machine tracking setup for a long time, for probably 15 years. Um, everything was done like that. 16 track on the Ampex, 24 track on the Studer. Here's, uh, here's Studio B. So this is uh, a 48 channel undertone console. This one has the natural bronze finish, uh, unlike the, uh, the Studio A one that has the, the black patina on it. And then uh, Check out the the shop. This is where consoles get built. <laughs> Just all the little bits and pieces we need for uh, assembling circuit boards and putting things together. So we have things sort of uh, separated into um, different board categories. So these are all the components that are associated with the, the tube output stages, 
This is the tube inversion stage, all the parts that are associated with that. Um, these are output boards. These are uh, just general resistors. Over there we have the power distribution, master section board A, the meter boards, all that stuff, all the different parts associated with the different circuit boards in the consoles. If somebody orders a console, it takes about three months to build it. Um, we just, you know, the first thing we do is order all of the parts. Some of those take a little while to come in. And, um, you know, the first thing that shows up is circuit boards. And uh, we actually have a, um, a, a manufacturing place called G&J &J that um, does the initial uh, circuit board stuffing. And then we get them back here and start assembling stuff. And then other things like knobs and face plates and other stuff will start showing up. And then we can, you know, do the stenciling on the face plates and um, get the silk screening done and laser etching on the knobs. And, like, there's all these various stages that have to happen in order for things to get finished and then ultimately get assembled. And overall, it takes about three months to, to build a console. So here we are at the Undertone Audio Factory, interrupting Roger, doing his wiring. This is uh, a 24-channel console that we're building right now. That's, there's the, the master section there. And uh, going here, Mike's working on uh, putting knobs on. Hey. Here's the little factory, putting knobs on modules. That's Mike right there. How you doing? There's Dre. Hey. This is Tim. And there's Tim. Tim. So there's, uh, here's all the modules that are going to go in this little 24-channel console. Um, looks like it's very close to being done.